Yeah, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is History is Here to Help. And we have two historians. We have Peter Hoffenberg and Carl Ackerman. And we're going to talk about the trajectory in Europe between 1945 and now, and what factors have changed Europe and how Europe has changed. It's like taking two snapshots, then and now, and I suppose a, 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 an expectation about where it's going to go. Peter Hoffenberg, a history professor at UH. Peter, can you introduce Carl? We need to know more about him. Only the good stuff. Only the good stuff. All right, so then it'll have to be very brief. No. Uh, a great pleasure once again to see Dr. Ackerman. I think most folks recognize him today. Jay and I have corralled him for one of his yamakas, which he wears, and that is as a PhD recipient and earner in Russian and modern European history from uh, the finest university in the Bay Area, University of California, Berkeley. And Jay and I would like him to be able to help us think, as Jay suggested, what's going on in Europe? Uh, we know up in the newspaper, we see Putin and we see Ukraine. We see Brexit and the uh, after earners of Brexit. We see continued questions about the US role in immigration. So Carl, welcome. Uh, we look forward to your expertise. And let me turn back uh, to my mentor, Mr. Jay Fidel for questions and hey, thank you, uh, Peter. Let's rock and roll. Uh, Carl, let's take a quick snapshot of the way it was in 45. Europe was a wreck. It had gone through a very destructive war on all levels. Um, the Jewish people were scattered all around Europe in displaced personnel, what they call the DP camps. Um, and, um, and the economies of all those countries were a wreck. Um, and the, the great savior was the Marshall Plan. Um, where the U.S. used its um, leadership uh, as the winner of that war uh, to try to, uh, you know, bring Europe into a more acceptable, you know, condition. Um, it was a wreck. And then the snapshot now is different. So can you, can you give me your, your views of those two snapshots? And then we'll talk about, you know, the dynamics between the two. You know, Jay um, and Peter, thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. And uh, I just, um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be with these uh, two fine, distinguished, and scholarly men. It's just a pleasure. And I'll always say that. One. I covered say, uh, one. Yes. Okay. Anyway, so um, I was thinking about this, um, our talk today. And I think that, you know, in 1945, if I were to characterize um, important things, I would suggest that. You know, it wasn't <clears throat> too much longer after 1945 that both the Soviet Union and the United States, of course, the United States had a pre-1945 nuclear weapon. And that will shape most of what is to come in terms of strategy for both of these countries and for the rest of the world. The second thing I would say is shortly thereafter of 1945, you, you have, you know, the European community first you know, um, with things like coal, and then later, you know, the, the European Union. And if you, if you, if you understand these two things, um, many of the problems, for example, the United States is facing with, with Russia right now are based on these two things, meaning that, you know, the United States can't go in with a lot of military action and um, fight the Soviet Union directly because we're both uh, nuclear powers. And the other thing is that what Putin is objecting to, and of course, after World War II, and going back to your original question, Jay, um, the Soviet Union had a bu had buffer states, you know, in Eastern Europe. Um, the the Soviet Union under Stalin had enforced, um, you know, five year plans and collectivization and their strategies on Eastern Europe. And um, I think that um, those things, especially, have um, you know influenced the mindset of Vladimir Putin. Um, so, um, especially because there is this really strong, not, not mythology, but heroic notion that the Soviet Union really defeated the, the Nazi um, warriors, you know, or Nazi horde, um, you know, and, and, and in some ways, rightfully so. I mean, that's a, that's a myth that's not really a myth, but a truism. So, you know, this shapes, you know, our... Um, contemporary framework. And I, I want to say one more thing, um, because Vladimir Putin is dominating the news, is generally in Russia, since the time of Peter the Great, you have two forms of leaders. One is Western thinking, 
like Gorbachev. And um, the other is more intrinsically Russian and wants to defend and be um, focused on, on Russian attitude. And um, so I think uh, Vladimir Putin is of the latter. And I, I'm just trying to frame this and I don't want to say anything else because we have a limited amount of time. But anyway, that's my answer to your question, your thoughtful question today. Okay, well, let's look at the, uh, the current snapshot. Um, you know, we have um, issues around NATO, issues around the EU, issues around the migrants, uh, issues about the economies, issues about climate change, issues about Brexit, um, you know, um, and COVID. Uh, Europe has been buffeted by serious issues over the past few years. And query, um, is it in better condition now than it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago? Is the, uh, is, is the direction up? Um, or is the trajectory not so up? Um, Peter, what's the current situation vis-a-vis -vis all of these factors in Europe now? In Europe, in Europe today, if you ask what its future relationship will be, it sounds like that's what you're, what you're that's, asking. That's a third yeah. question. Uh, I, I think if you, if you look economically, uh, Europe uh, will recover from Brexit, and there are still economic relations between Russia and the West. So we're not talking about economic anarchy, but as a region, I think it's pretty clear it's not going to be able to compete with China, right, as an economic region. I doubt it can compete with India as an economic region, and really if Brazil ever got its political act together. So I would say, and probably the answer is not going to satisfy you, there will be a Europe. It will not be an impoverished Europe, but I think, and, and Carl can correct me, um, I think probably since the First World War and Europe has had to constantly reconsider its world role. And so the idea of uh, Europe at the central in the 19th century. Uh, and what I would add to connect both of your questions, I completely agree with what Carl had said. Uh, there are a few other connections I would make to help answer your question, uh, Jay. Uh, I think if we're looking at 1945 to 2021, uh, the history of the relationship between Europe and its colonies needs to be factored in. Uh, 1945, hence, was a series of decolonizations. It's not complete yet. And, and that is meant vis-a-vis -vis the issues that uh, Carl was talking about, European confidence, Europeans' wealth, Europe's wealth, Europe's military position, all to a certain degree have been lessened. It has also made Europe consider what uh, America and Brazil and the Spanish Empire considered, which is a, is a multiracial democracy possible. I mean, honestly, that's not an issue in Britain really until 1949. It's not really an issue in France until the end of the Algerian War. So to answer your question and, and to build upon Carl's excellent points, I think one is a social change as far as race and ethnicity. And secondly, uh, the change in power vis-a-vis -vis the colonies which meant, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the rest of the world. Um, so How I don't look at your right. Here. How about the move right, the emergence of a, of a, a stronger right wing, the emergence of autocracies? Uh, would you consider that part of this analysis? Carl, do you want to go first? Sure. You know, uh, my, my take on the, on the right, unlike in the United States, where there's been, you know, um, an emergent right, um, well, for a long time, but I mean, but more recently, very dangerous uh, emergent right. Um, I think the right has been in European parliamentary politics for a fairly long time. And you've had Le Pen, you know, in France, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you go back to the, you know, pre-World War uh, two days with, you know, um, with Mosley in, in Great Britain, et cetera. Um, so <clears throat> with parliamentary democracies, there's room for a sort of fringe, um, right groups, but these right groups are ascendant. Um, and I think that, you know, um, Jay, you asked the, the critical question, which is, you know, what role does the sort of migration of immigrants largely as a result of, you know, destabilization and things from colonial ventures in the 19th century, you know, back, you know, uh, four or 500 years. So, um, I, I think that this is, you know, a, a, a more dangerous phenomena with, you know, um, right wing pundits coming to the fore um, with, you know, and there are exceptions. I mean, if you look at the recent elections in 
um, in Germany, uh, Merkel is replaced by someone who's probably a little bit more left than she was, even though she did a wonderful job. So I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not convinced that this is, you know, going to be the um, um, outcome. But you know, if we have, again, I, I mentioned this last time, if we get people like Tucker Carlson, um, you know, welcoming Hungarian dictator into his show, um, uh, you know, which doesn't surprise. Um, now with what Fox is doing, um, uh, you know, this is problematic. Peter? I would say, uh, building upon that important riff, uh, one of the differences is there is much more of a global immediate interaction. So the Nazi party, for example, had clearly influenced the US. There were 25,000 people in the Nazi party. Uh, but these days, and Jay, I know this is one of your interests with mass media, uh, there isn't really just a European right the European right talks to the American right. Uh, when they can put aside their, their uh, racist blinders, they talk to Modi and Hindu. And I think that, to me, is more dangerous than specific right-wing groups in Europe. Um, there's a long history of that. Uh, you can at least go back in many ways to the counter-revolutionaries, the French Revolution. These people speak a lot like, like those folks. But I think the real danger is, uh, European right influencing the American right. The well, American we ought to talk about this. Yes. This is very, right. this is very uh, important. You mentioned that the Marshall Plan followed 1945. It was very positive. It was a high moral track for the United States. It, it was consistent with global leadership and the way we saw ourselves as a, as a world leader. Um, and then you'd have Trump uh, running down NATO and running down the EU and running down our relationship with Europe in general. Um, and um, you know, leveraging his uh, special connection with uh, with autocrats. <clears throat> so I, I ask you this question, Peter: uh, How how is our diplomatic relations with Europe um, doing? Um, how 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 is our um, standing with them doing? Uh, and where is all of that going? Because um, we no longer, I believe, have the same kind of clout. Um, they no longer. You know, say what did they say in Paris? Uh, speak French, you guys. Tous, uh, tous, tous. Uh, we are all American. We are all American. I don't think that they would say that these days. Um, I don't think they feel the same way about us, and that's largely due to Trump. But it's it's also been a pattern over over the, these years. We're no longer with the Marshall Plan. We're in some other place, and they are in some other place with us, right? Very much so. It's probably worth inviting Carl back to have a discussion about that. Uh, but the immediate uh, response to you is it's a relationship, and both parties have changed. So the America that liberated Italy, France, and the rest of Europe in 1945 was also the America that killed three to five million Vietnamese. And so when we talk about the Marshall Plan, uh, the Marshall Plan was replaced in Europe by many people over the Vietnam War and the point that Carl made early on. Uh, one of the largest movements in Europe between 45 and our time was the movement for nuclear disarmament, a major movement throughout Europe, uh, and we were the bad guys. So I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm just saying if we look at that, we also have to look at what the US did. Now, as far as the European relationship, I think um, those, those of us who have time, and I maybe don't have time, but we gotta get behind the headlines. So the headlines might say there's a spat, and clearly there are plenty of spats. Uh, but even under President Trump's regime, there were still contacts and diplomacy being made. You know, if, if there were not diplomacy, probably Putin would have already invaded Ukraine. So I think my answer to you, I may not satisfy you, but we've got to get behind the headlines, behind the screaming, and notice that uh, in general, I would say our reputation is better now. But our reputation now is also, better than it was during Trump. Right. But it's also, let's remember, uh, connected to the killing of George Floyd. There was a Black Lives Matter movement in Europe. Uh, and whereas there are plenty of reasons for Euro Europeans to be upset about racism, uh, that was in good part inspired. So we have to look at what does America mean? You know, in 1945, unless you were an absolute Stalinist, America meant you saved. Right, you, you, we all know the photos of Paris and Rome, et cetera. Okay, other than um, 
limited example, you know, usually referring to Berlin, has rarely been that kind of generational response. But I would put to you that most Americans have changed as well. Yeah. Most, of, most Americans don't look at us the way we look at ourselves. It's true. 45. I think it's a great topic. We should buy Carl back. It, you know, Carl, I, I want to just in, uh, ask you one thing. You know, the, the leadership that we demonstrated after the war uh, has continued. It, it may be modified. It may not be as robust as it was. And maybe it's like unconscious, subconscious. For example, I give you this and see what you think about it. Um, so we had, I think it originated in the United States, this anti-vax movement, where for religious reasons or political reasons or a combination of those, maybe it's all conflated, um, you know, people didn't want to take a, a vaccine, even though they were taking vaccines for every childhood disease you can think about for our lifetime. Okay, then you look again, you look at Europe, and now there's an anti-vax movement in Europe. Now, is that indigenous to Europe or is that merely copycat? Is that merely this kind of negative leadership, uh, this momentum leadership that the people in Europe see uh, emulating what goes on in the U.S.? What do you think? You know, uh, if I had to come down on one of those two sides, I would say probably it's indigenous to Europe. Um, I'm, I, you know, I, I think the, 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 the thing about the vaccine is it's very personal. And there are people who are um, generally not well-educated or sometimes people who are just well-educated and are kind of kooky, um, you know, won't follow um, scientific precepts. And because it's being something that the government is ordering you to do to yourself, um, I think there's a natural inclination to doubt it, even if that it's, even though if it's, it's science-induced, much to my chagrin, this is happening like this. But I think, Going back to your to your um, question that you asked Peter and myself about um, about our role, the American role in Europe, I think with Joe Biden it is significantly different. I think, and I think it's for two reasons. One, the European leaders know Biden, and they trust him. Um, you know, the smarter leaders know that Trump was an aberrant uh, personality, um, and even if you had a conservative. Uh, uh, Mike Pence comes to mind, you know, conservative, uh, sort of um, crazy right wing person. And, you know, I, in some ways, Mike Pence is not that, but I mean, in general, you know, things, his positions are pretty far right. Um, it, they wouldn't have had the same reaction. And the, the danger, my feeling uh, is that the, the danger that Europeans saw is they couldn't predict um, Donald Trump doing things way that made any sense to anyone who had been in sort of like geopolitical culture. And so um, in that way, I mean, even our foes didn't know what to make of this guy because, you know, he's, he's very shallow intellectually. And as soon as people realize that, then they realize that we're deep kimchi, as one might say in Hawaii, um, when it comes to foreign policy. Um, but I think Biden has restored things. And of course, you know, if uh, if, you know, with Macron and, and you know, if, 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 if the French don't know about a deal that the United States is making with some sort of, um, you know, um, armament and, and they leave the French out, you know, it's going to create problems no matter who's president and, and what's going on. But I think there's been a great uh, rapprochement with the, with, the, um, with the European leaders since uh, Joe Biden has been traveling. Like this. And, you know, even what's, what's interesting is you know, um, not so in, in Joe Biden's case, but if you have, you know, a secretary of state, like let's take George Bush Jr., um, who's, you know, who probably at the beginning had limited foreign policy experience. He had Condoleezza Rice by him. And, you know, this is a political scientist of Stanford stature and, you know, who knew at least what she was doing. Even if you disagreed with her, she was, you know, on, on you know, the normal, within the, within the normal framework. and. Um, just to conclude on one last thing um, is uh, the, the, the notion of um, uh, um, Vladimir Putin going back to Russia for a bit. Vladimir Putin is a real politic guy. You know, I mean, he's, he studied, he knows. He's a really sharp character. If you listen to what he's saying, he has to please his local audience. He's, on a, he's, a, he's in an economy that's shaped by natural gas. And a lot of this is posturing and things like this. But, as we know from the 
Soviet period, strength is the only thing that's going to push this guy back. And um, I'm not talking about you being really aggressive. I'm just saying strength. And um, you mean rather than just words? Well, rather, I mean, if you talk about sanctions, I'm not sure what kind of sanctions you're talking about. Now, I think it's very clever of the United States to start focusing on his, his little cabal and removing their assets or even focusing on Putin's assets and things like this. And, you know, I think if we were smart about it, you know, um, you know, I think Biden is doing a pretty good job, but I, I think we have to um, really, um, you know, put the kibosh on this thing and know that Putin just wants, um, and from his point of view, for very good reason, Ukraine never to join NATO because he's, there used to be a buffer. And now, I mean, you know, if you look at Russia, the Soviet history, you know, people have invaded Russia, Napoleon and, and Hitler. So I'm the words, you know, he's scared. And he sees uh, it as losing territory and, and, and yes. incursion. Uh, can I, I want to ask you one more question that has to do with the, you know, the future. And, and for that, I want to put a map up. Um, so, uh, Eric, can you put the map of Russia up? I'm sorry, the map, <laughs> I'm leading myself here. <laughs> this is a map um, showing you all the countries as they exist today uh, right, in Europe. Putin, and, Putin, Russia. Right. <laughs> so, Peter, Russia. Peter, how, how right. is this map, how is Europe going to change going forward? Let's leave it on the screen for a minute, and you can sort of draw us the map of the future of Europe. Well, I, I personally, and, and Carl, please uh, correct me from your point of view, I personally don't see that map changing significantly. Uh, I see uh, potential devolution in Britain, uh, potentially Ireland will be united and Scotland will go its separate ways. But most of those uh, nation states uh, are protected in one way or another, either militarily or politically. So I think the issue, um, and it's what you're getting at, slightly tweaking it, is in a way not the map, uh, but the map of ideas. So will uh, Putin's ideas about autocracy, or uh, let's say Macron's ideas about republicanism, will they have influence across those borders? Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, and we've talked about this every week because it's important, with uh, social media, we just don't know. I mean, we know those ideas can spread, both good and bad. And we know also that governments and high-tech companies can take measures to prevent them. So I think, uh, you know, uh, Yahweh willing, I have a grandchild. Uh, that kid's map is not going to look all that much different. But the societies and politics within them, like I don't really see, and Carl, Carl can correct me, I don't see Putin, you know, doing much beyond Ukraine, even if it's Ukraine. I don't see him pulling you know, an Alexander or a Napoleon, and I don't see anybody in the West doing that either. I hey, that Carl, you, I there's that the map for question. you, Carl. Same question for you. Um, let's show Carl the map. Carl, um, to what extent do you agree with Peter, and to what extent would you add to that? I, I completely agree with Peter, and, and I, um, I, you know, I, he noted that the Scotland, I mean, <laughs> you know, the Scots may vote for independence, but they're you know, I mean, how independent will they be? And I, I think that, you know, um, the Europe, you know, my feeling is that most logical people who have experienced some form of parliamentary democracy, um, um, you know, curbs coming, curbs going away, um, realize that, you know, that some form of mixture between socialism and capitalism in most of their countries um, has produced, you know, a pretty good life for most Europeans. And of course, they have great um, health care systems in most European countries, and they have um, great um, um, schooling uh, facilities and ability to go to school. Although one might say that in the United States, we have more access, but probably less people that are going to school. Um, but so I, I agree with Peter completely. And I think also one of the things that uh, Americans I, I don't realize is that when the, when when the Soviet Union was involved in Afghanistan, and then Putin, Russia was involved in Afghanistan. Russians were not weren't happy about their boys coming home in boxes. And you know, if he goes into the Ukraine this time, there's going to be there's going to be Russians to die. And I think that you know, I, I don't think that I, I think that Vladimir Putin is fully cavalier enough to do 
do that, but he's going to suffer the consequences. Because well, my, my theory about that, Carl, is he's going to try to take Ukraine without firing a shot by using, uh, you know, strategies of communication and, and diplomacy, negative diplomacy. But he's, I agree with you. He's, he's not going to go in and, and, um, and, and send boys home in boxes. Let me ask you one more question, and that is this. We follow China. And China was recently in the newspapers. You can take a train now from Shanghai to Lisbon, Portugal, part of the Belt Road. Um, this is quite remarkable and that we should be living in the time when this, this, this possibility is turning into a reality. How is China's influence, and I know it's, it's, it's futuresque, but how is China's influence through Belt Road and, and trade and manufacturing and you know, economics in general, global economics going to change Germany um, in competing with Germany and Europe in general? Carl, you go first. Well, I'm going to have to leave in one minute, so I will go first. I'll be very brief. You know, um, the influence of China is going to be twofold. One is going to be, of course, which we know if anyone, if you go to Walmart, um, uh, the tremendous economic output of China. Um, and so I think, it's, you know, it, it's the major player that the United States is doing with today. That's why a lot of our attention is focused on China. Um, the second thing I think is in the military capacity in the Pacific, uh, which we're going to have to pay more attention to because China's buildup has been quite significant. And if you talk to any, you know, uh, SINGPAC or any uh, military leader in the Pacific, they are very worried about this. And I think they should be. I think China is much more reasonable in terms of geopolitics um, than Russia is. But I, I think that, you know, um, if you're talking about out economic output, and especially for our state of Hawaii, uh, China is is the big is 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 the is the big gorilla. It, you know, he, he, China is really going to be um, um, quite significant. And having said that, it's been a, a joy to, to speak with three with two Ashkenazi, and uh, um, such a pleasure. And I'm off to a board meeting, but um, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Peter. You both uh, described the word bench. And, you know, in your personalities, and it's um, always a pleasure to speak with you. Carl, Carl, uh, uh, don't turn your machine off just now. Let's give Peter uh, a chance to summarize and well, close before you I, leave. I know Carl needs to go. So, uh, Carl, thank you very much. And I think in response to Jay's question, um, Europe today is fundamentally different than 1945, but in a way facing some similar challenges. Carl mentioned nuclear war. Well, Europe is also facing the question of war. Jay mentioned displaced persons. Europe is also facing the question of migration. So whereas the, the still photos look a little different, I think behind the scenes, Jay and Carl, we've seen some very similar uh, dilemmas. And I look forward to talking to both of you guys very soon again. Uh, aloha. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, Jay. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Peter. Thank you, Carl. Thank aloha. You.